This podcast is presented to you by Pastor Derek Armstrong and Word of Grace Community Church. For more information, please visit wogcc.com. Over the past few weeks, we've been talking about how Jesus is our healer. Spent the past three weeks really building that foundation and explaining that throughout Scripture, how Jesus heals our physical body and exactly what that process looks like some reasons why people don't get healed, as well as we talked about different roadblocks and responsibilities that we as individuals have. So if you missed any of the previous messages, I would just encourage you to go back. You can listen to them online on the website, or you can watch video through the app or through the website, or you can download those things and share them with other people. I would encourage you to do that if you missed any of those, because I believe that they'll be very helpful and beneficial to you, so you can know exactly how it is that we are to grow in trust in God, and you can know exactly how to move forward in your walk with God to deepen that trust and dependence on Him. Now, as we're finishing out this series on Christ being our healer, as I was praying and preparing this week, I thought, let's take a different turn here from talking about the physical side, because we have spent a great deal of time dealing with physical healing. And as I was praying and studying and asking God what to share, I believe that this is what uh, is from the Lord today today. And I'm very excited to share it with you. If you're a note taker, write this title down, Emotionally Healthy. We're going to talk about how not only God wants to heal you physically, but he also wants to heal you emotionally. A lot of times people don't have a problem with God healing people physically. We expect that from God at a certain level, or at least we will ask him at a certain level. Maybe you don't ask God in the little things. Maybe you wait till the big catastrophic things. But some people, uh, they, they, they recognize that God, he wants to heal us physically. And we see that clearly in his scripture. We see that in the word. But not only does God want to heal us physically, but he also wants to heal us emotionally. We have to understand this idea that God cares for us, both spirit, soul, and body. He cares for every aspect of our lives, even the areas that we feel like we're bothering God with. A lot of people have this idea that I don't want to bother God. He must be really busy or he doesn't really care. And I think if we really want to be honest with ourselves, that's really what we would say, is that we don't know that God really cares about those little details of our lives. But yet we see over and over again in Scripture where God is concerned with the what we would deem minuscule details in our lives. We see that he knows the very number of hairs on our head. What does that have to do with anything? Why would that be important unless you have like a certain desire of hair count that you're trying to achieve? Then maybe you would say, God, could you let me in on that information? You know, just like people get excited when they have a higher thread count in their sheets. Oh, this is Egyptian cotton. It's 800 thread count. It's the best. It's so soft. Well, my hair is a 1500 hair count. My hair is a 2500 hair count. You know, I I don't know. Maybe you're that person. Maybe that's why in there. That's why that's in scripture. But I think the greater reason that that would be found in scripture would be it would let us know that God cares about the things that really we don't even think matter. He cares about all of that. And he wants you to know that he cares about you. And we also see in scripture where Jesus said, cast all your care upon me because I care for you. He didn't say cast selected cares upon me because those are the ones I'm really concerned about. And the other ones I don't really care. That's not what he said. He said, cast all your cares upon me because I care for you. So the thing that that's grounded in is the fact that he cares for us, that he loves us, and he cares about those small details of your life, and he cares about the things that perhaps you haven't brought to him. And he cares about the things that you think that he may not be concerned with or that don't matter to him, but he does care. He cares about every detail of your life. That includes your emotional health. And I'm going to show you today in Scripture how Jesus died so we could not only be physically healthy, so we could not only be saved, so we could not only be redeemed, so we could not only be forgiven, but also so we could walk in emotional health. So let's go to the scripture this morning in the book of Proverbs. Let's look at the 17th chapter. Perhaps you forgot your Bible this morning because you were more concerned about staying dry, trying to get from your your house perhaps to the vehicle, and it was just one of those things that slipped your mind, or you were looking for your kid's shoe. Why is it they only have one shoe It's like, man, we've got single shoes everywhere. 
Uh, but uh, maybe you were looking for a kid's shoe, you forgot your Bible. We have Bibles in the back by the sound booth. There's uh, two different areas that you can go grab one of those if you forgot. Or if you don't have a Bible, consider that our gift to you. When nobody's going to tackle you on the way out, you can have one of those and you can take that for your very own. It's an English Standard Translation and that's what I preach out of. So if you ever wonder why does Pastor Derek's Bible maybe read a little differently than yours, it's because maybe you don't have the same translation. I'm using the English Standard just because I like the way that it reads and I think that it's an accurate translation as well as one that uh, helps us just to understand things a little bit more. So with that being said, Proverbs 17 and 22 says, a joyful heart is good medicine, but a crushed spirit dries up the bones. Let's look at that again. A joyful heart is good medicine, but a crushed spirit dries up the bones. We see in the New King James, you may see that it says a, a merry heart does good like a medicine, but a broken spirit dries up the bones. You see, the reason that a bone would be dried up is because there's no life flowing through it. There's nothing providing health to that bone. And so because that bone is deficient of the things that it needs to be strong and to be healthy, it is beginning to dry up. And that's what will happen if we allow that broken spirit that enemy to come in and to try to get us to believe the lies of depression, fear, anxiety, uh, aloneness, whatever it may be, rejection, these different lies that are introduced to us that we will oftentimes believe, it sends us down this path that begins to suck the very life out of us. That can be unforgiveness, it can be bitterness, it can be anger, it can be something that someone said to you years ago or something someone did or didn't do, it could be a previous relationship that you have had. It could be your ex-spouse. It could be your parents. It could be your boss. It could be a a religious leader, a pastor. It could be any number of things that the enemy has tried to use to suck the life out of you. And if we allow these things to draw life from us and draw our joy from us and steal from us the very thing that God wants us to enjoy, and that's His joy and peace that only comes from contentment in Him, then what happens is that we begin to feel weak. We begin to feel weary. And guess what? You mess with that stuff long enough, it's going to affect your health. It will affect your physical body, will it not? You will begin to not take care of yourself like you should. You'll begin to abuse your body by either under eating or overeating. You'll begin to abuse your body by not getting up and moving around and, and just sitting at home. And just filling your, your mind with all kinds of junk on TV because you're just too sad, you're too depressed, you're too upset, you're too angry. Or you'll begin to run to uh, relationships that help you to justify how you feel. You'll begin to re- run to those friendships and those circles of people that feel the same way you do or will only help take your anger and frustration and unforgiveness and bitterness to the next level. They'll help you experience a whole new level of anger that you never even knew was there. Oh, great. I never knew I could be this angry. This is not as awesome as I thought it would be. And oftentimes, that's where that stuff leads us. And it sucks the life out of us. That's why a merry heart, a joyful heart, does good like a medicine. It helps us to actually find healing. But if we live our lives with that broken spirit, then it will suck the life out of us. It will, it will actually dry us up. And some people never move past the deep emotional wounds that they have experienced in their life. Every one of us have had trials. Every one of us have been wounded in some way, shape, or form by an individual, by someone perhaps that we care deeply about, by someone who promised us something, by situations and circumstances, by... Uh, circumstances that were out of our control, maybe the way you were raised, the environment that you were brought up in, maybe decisions other people made that affected you directly or indirectly. Every one of us are going to go through those things. No one is exempt from experiencing those types of things in life. The difference is how we handle those things. Amen? The difference isn't whether or not we as Christians are going to experience those things or not. It's not, I become a Christian, I go to church, and all of a sudden everything is supposed to be going my way. And everything is just supposed to be clicking right along, and I have no more trials, or I have no more challenges in life, or no one's ever going to do me wrong. Everyone's going to respect me like I should be respected. Everyone's going to treat me like I should be treated. I'm going to have plenty of money in the bank. I'm going to be sleeping well at night. I'm going to feel great physically, and I'm always going to have a great winning mental attitude every day I wake up. And that's what Christians should be. 
man, that, that doesn't happen. Not every day. Because there's junk in this world that wants to steal from you, right? There's junk in this world that would want to try to destroy you and hurt you. So you're going to be challenged. The difference is not whether or not Christians go through challenges. The difference is how we handle them and how we respond to those challenges. And you're going to have people come along and wound you. The difference is, with Christians, is that we're not supposed to put faces and names with the woundedness. But too often we do. We put faces and names with it, and that's what gets us stuck, is that we miss what the real enemy is. We think the enemy is our parents. We think the enemy is our boss. We think the enemy is that person who called themselves my friend, but they turned out to really stab me in the back. That's who we think the enemy is. And those people have names, and those people have faces. And we attach their names and faces to the woundedness, and so therefore we never move on past that. And it affects the way we treat other people. It affects the way we trust people. It affects what we're willing to go the distance with people. It affects so many areas of our lives. But the Bible says very specifically that we do not battle against flesh and blood. But we are battling against principalities and powers and rulers of darkness in high places. You see, it's not the name and the face that you're battling against. It's actually darkness that would want to try to come in and grab a hold of your heart and would want to suck the very life out of you and steal and rob your joy. That's the real enemy, not that name, not that face, not that company. That's not the enemy. The enemy is that spiritual darkness and the only one who can empower that person or empower that darkness or empower that wickedness is you. You give life to it when you gossip about it. You give life to it when you begin to surround yourself with other negative people who like to talk about negative things and you all enjoy being negative together. And maybe you even have some friends that you weren't friends with before until you began having marriage problems or until you began having some problems with a a certain individual at work. And then all of a sudden you became buddies and the foundation of your friendship was negativity against the other person. Oh, that sounds like a winning recipe for friends. No, they're only going to help justify the way you already feel and they're only going to feed the monster of that spiritual darkness that's trying to creep in. It has a different name, it has a different face, but we all face the same principality and power. And it's all overcome the same way. And we don't need to allow it to suck the life out of it. And one of the things that we need to recognize is that it's not a name, it's not a face, and I'm not going to be against this person. Instead, I need to recognize my true enemy, which is the devil, which is the wicked one, the evil one, who wants to try to come in and take over my life and tell me how to think and tell me how to act and react. And the world is great at this. They don't know any different. The world has its system. The world has its values. It says, if somebody hurts you, you hurt them back. If somebody talks bad about you and sling mud about you, you go out and you sling mud back, and that's what you do. And you want to get some drama started? Oh, yeah, we'll get some drama started. You want to make this real? We'll make it real. That's what the world says. The world says, you want to get up in my face? I'll stand up taller and get up in your face. The world says that you caused me and my family pain, and so I want to cause you and your family pain. That's what the world does. And when that happens, nobody checks up. Nobody notices, because that's what everybody does. Somebody does you wrong in a business deal, you wish and pray that they fail. And we just go, yeah, they're going to get what's coming to them. And that's what we do. And nobody freaks out when that happens. You want to make somebody's head spin, though? Do something counterculture that's outside of the value system of this world. Do something that's in the value system of God and do something countercultural to what's acceptable in the world's eyes and begin to love someone and forgive them. And then all of a sudden somebody goes, you did what? Oh, I would never forgive them. I would never have done that. After what they did to you, are you serious? Yeah. I'm going to forgive them and I'm going to move them because... God cares about my emotional health, and I'm not going to let that thing suck the life out of me by me giving power to it. By me plugging that thing up and getting that thing all charged up and it short-circuiting my life and sucking the life out of me. 
I'm not going to waste my time doing that. And so you need to recognize the source. You need to recognize where that stuff comes from. And you need to recognize that you're not going to give power to it because you know that it's going to suck the very life out of you. Some people spend their whole lives stuck in that, though. Some people live reactively out of their woundedness. They feel like a victim. They feel like they're angry at others or believe that they're, uh, they, they believe some kind of lie that's directed their outlook in life. And everything they see is through this tainted filter, through this messed up filter of their own woundedness. And that's how they treat other people. They snap at other people or they're rude or they're angry. No, they're, they're not really rude or angry people. They're really just wounded people that are living out of a lie somewhere. And they need somebody to love them. They need somebody to show them something different. They need somebody to walk a little further with them because everyone else gave up on them because they didn't want to put up with it because they just wanted to react like everybody else has always treated them and always acted. Somebody needs to show them something different. Hello, somebody. Why don't we go over to the book of Isaiah in the 53rd chapter. Now, check this out. There's something interesting about Isaiah. He was a prophet that God gave direction to primarily about the people of Israel. So when God spoke to Isaiah and told him to write things down or told him to share things with the people of Israel, a lot of it was turn and repent. A lot of it was, you know, um, God is unhappy with you because of what you've done. And that was the majority of the theme of Isaiah's prophecy. But then all of a sudden he takes this really weird turn in the 52nd chapter of Isaiah. And he begins to talk about what we know as the Messiah, the Savior, the Redeemer, and his name is Jesus. He begins to speak about this hope that we have. Now all of a sudden he's no longer talking to the Israelites about all of their need to turn and repent and all the calamity that's going to befall upon them if they don't, how they need to remember they're God's chosen people. All of a sudden he goes, there's something's coming, okay? Someone's coming, and he's going to make all things new. He's going to change things. Because the reason things are as bad as that they've been is because we're disconnected from God and because we right now are disconnected from that hope. And he said, there's hope coming. There's someone coming. And so he begins to prophesy about that Savior in Isaiah 52, and he continues that in Isaiah 53. So let's pick up in Isaiah 53 um, and verse 1. Isaiah says this, Who has believed what he has heard from us? And to whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? He grew up before him like a young plant and like a root out of the dry ground. He had no form or majesty that we should look at him and no beauty that we should desire him. So this is describing Jesus as saying, listen, he's going to grow up from a small child and he's not going to be like this superstar celebrity that you're going to go, wow, that's that's a good looking guy right there. He's special. He's going to do big things with his life. You know, like when he smiles, he gets a little ting. You know what I'm talking about? It's like all of a sudden freeze frame and he gets the little, little ching thing happening with his smile. No, that didn't happen. It wasn't like he was on the cover of some magazine and everybody just knew there's something about this guy. No, said that there would be no reason for you to think that. Verse 3, but even in spite of that, he was despised and rejected by men. A man of sorrows, acquainted with grief. Talking about Jesus. Jesus is familiar with sorrows. Jesus is familiar with grief. Jesus is familiar with being despised. Jesus is familiar with being rejected. All the things that you and I experience in this life. We're afraid of rejection. So we change who we are to try to please other people. We're afraid of them not liking us. We're afraid of them not accepting us. And so we alter who we are. But Jesus was rejected. We're afraid of being despised. And so we alter who we are. And and we live a lie because we're afraid of being despised. Jesus was despised. We're, we don't want to be sad. We don't want to be sorrowful. So we try to go heap for ourselves all the stuff we think will make us happy. We, we, we spend all of our money trying to, trying to have these little moments of happiness. I'll never forget one time when I was a youth pastor that there was a couple in our church that we were hanging out with in Oklahoma. Sweet couple. They were just really struggling financially. And they came to the church one day for music practice, and uh, we were talking about our weekend, and the wife of uh, uh, this guy, she, she said, uh, oh yeah, we just got back from having a big shopping spree. I said, I thought you guys said you were struggling. You asked me to pray for you last week. Yeah, but you know, we just really needed to go out there and just feel good. So we just need to have a little splurge, you know, a little feel-good splurge. We think that We can just buy our way into happiness. Look for those little moments of joy being released or 
a false sense of joy rather being released by purchasing things but Jesus was sorrowful we don't ever want to truly grieve over things we we just we just want it to go away but Jesus was a man that experienced grief so what I'm trying to get across to you is that Jesus understands and he cares amen, amen. because check out the next half of this verse and as for one from whom men hide their faces he was despised and we esteem him not surely he has borne our griefs surely he has carried our sorrows yet we esteem him stricken smitten by God and afflicted but he was pierced for our transgressions he was crushed for our iniquities upon him was the chastisement that brought us peace and with his wounds we're healed all we like sheep have gone astray we have turned everyone to his own way and the Lord has laid on Jesus laid on him the iniquity of us all Jesus not only understands our sorrows Jesus not only understands rejection Jesus not only understands grief but he took your grief your pain your sorrow he took it upon himself so you could experience his peace the Bible says that he actually was chastised in our place so that we could know peace. He understands emotional woundedness. He understands how that feels to be betrayed by someone that was very close to you. He understands how it feels to be spat upon and mocked by people who once celebrated you. He understands those emotions. And he took those things for you so you could know peace. He was wounded for your transgressions and bruised for your iniquities. And the chastisement that was on him brought us peace by his wounds, by his stripes. We are healed. Jesus is the source of healing and peace. I'm giving you the answer here today. You might be, Pastor, we already know this. The problem with Every one of us, I believe, at a certain level, is that we know a whole heck of a lot more than we actually believe. We know all the right things. We've heard messages like this. You may have heard similar scriptures used in messages like this. Maybe you've heard somebody preach a message like this better than the one you're hearing now. But do you believe it? You can hear a message or read in Scripture that says that God loves you, that God cares about you, that He wants better for you than you want for yourself, that His peace passes your understanding, will guard your heart and your mind through Christ Jesus. And you can hear all those things, know those things, but do you believe those things? Because we quickly believe the lie, don't we? We believe the lie. We believe the lie because our, our life shows fruit that we believe the lie. Oh, well, you know, uh, it, it's because of my parents. Uh, it's my parents. You know, that's why I'm so stubborn, because my dad was stubborn, my grandpa was stubborn, great-grandpa was stubborn. I guess that's why I'm stubborn, too. That's why I'm not going to forgive or so-and-so for doing me wrong. We're just stubborn. And we joke about it. And we're miserable. Do you, do you want to live the rest of your life being stubborn and rooted and grounded in unforgiveness towards other people? Because if you want to, guess what? God will let you. But that's not His best for you. Amen? We make excuses. Oh, my mother, she was a worry wart. My grandmother, she's a worry wart too. Oh, we're just, we just worried about everything. You know, that's what we do. Oh, we're just so worried. <laughs> and we think like that's cute. That makes you miserable. I've lived that. I get that. That eats away at your peace. That's no fun. So you can joke about it all day long, or you can say, no, I want to be free from this because Jesus carried my grief. Jesus carried my sorrow. He was taking all of this junk on Himself so I could know peace. Not so I could live in fear and torment because 2 Corinthians 5 and 17 says, you are a new creation in Christ Jesus. All things are passed away and all things are become new. All things means all. It doesn't mean compartmentalized versions of things. Like, Jesus wants you to be free in this area and this area, but this one, He kind of wants you to be bound in. You know. That doesn't make sense because my Bible says that He who the Son has set free is free indeed. 
That doesn't mean partially free. That doesn't mean compartments of my life are, will be free. It means I will be completely and totally free. That means that all of this junk that I've been given life to and power to, I need to stop giving life to it. I need to stop believing it. I need to stop speaking it. And I need to start believing and speaking the truth because that's what makes me free. That's what I need to replace the lie with. Because if I believe the lie, I'm going to live out of the lie. I'm going to model the lie. And guess what I'm going to do for my children and my grandchildren? I'm going to pass the lie down to them to believe is truth. Oh, redheads are just short-tempered. Or red beards. They're, they're short-tempered. They're angry, angry little leprechauns. They're just angry people. They're just, they're just mean-spirited and hot-tempered. And you can say that to justify your behavior. And we say it as a joke. But what if someone else believes that? What if I put that on my children and they believe that? And they begin to make excuses for their behavior as if somehow our temperament is excusable because well, the color of my hair. We say those types of things but we actually, to a certain level, believe some of those things. Well, my mother was always afraid, so I guess it's just my lot in life. My father was stubborn and angry, so I guess it's just my lot in life. My father has just had an absolute miracle happen in his life, my, my earthly dad. I'm super happy and proud of him, and God's just done some amazing restorative work between he and I, and some of you know a little bit more about that journey. It's been incredible. He was up here visiting a few months ago. And one of the things that he shared with me was how he did not want for me and his grandchildren and the rest of the, the, the legacy that he was to leave to struggle with the same things that he and his fathers struggled with. And he told me that at five years old that his dad and grandfather took him to the bar while they sat there. He said, I was there for eight hours while they drank themselves silly. Eight hours, he said, when I was five years old. He said, I just sat at the bar, ate peanuts, while my dad and my grandpa just drank. Why were dad and grandpa drinking? Because that's what had been shown to them. Taking a little five-year-old to the bar when he should have been playing with his friends and, and having a good time. But no, for eight hours, sitting there, while these men drown their sorrows and try to solve the world's problems. Are you kidding me? What type of example is that? So my father then begin to determine in his heart, when I have kids, I'm going to do better. They're not going to see that. And I thank God that we didn't see that. We didn't see that growing up. My dad had his own struggles and his own things that God led him to a place of freedom and repentance to. And I thank God that he did that. But that junk was broken. And me and my children are not going to have to experience that. Somebody's got to make a decision. Enough. We're done with this. I'm not, my kids aren't going to have that experience. Because I'm not going to live my life dictated by fear. I'm not going to have my life dictated by substance abuse. I'm not going to have my life dictated by laziness, by poor financial management. I'm not going to have my life dictated by what other people think about us. I'm not going to have my life dictated by uh, stubbornness or anger or being short-tempered with people. No, I am going to allow the peace of Christ to rule and reign in my heart so that He can truly make me that new creation. I'm not going to let that stuff become normal because the only reason that we struggle with those things is because somewhere along the line we were introduced to a lie and we took it hook, line, and sinker. And we believe that. But you know the truth. But if you really know the truth, the truth will set you free. I didn't ask, could you quote a memory verse? Memory verses are good and fine, but it's dangerous if you think that just knowing it is good enough. You've got to believe it. Amen? Amen? Romans 10 17 says faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. You can know all the right things to say and you can fool me, but you can't fool God because the fruit of your life is going to show with what you truly believe. The fruit of your life. Do you want to hold on to that event that happened for the rest of your life where somebody did you wrong and you're singing the somebody done somebody wrong song? You're going to sing that song and hit replay for the rest of your life? Are you going to get stuck and play a victim to what someone else did? Or are you going to say, no, He bore my grief and my sorrow and He was chastised so I could know peace and I'm going to allow Him to take that burden because it's not the person that I'm fighting against anyways. 
It's these principalities and powers. And Jesus has come that I might have life and have it more abundantly. Jesus has come that I might have peace. Jesus has come that I might know peace. His chastisement brought us peace peace and I know you've been let down I know you've been rejected I know you've been disappointed and you have been wounded but Jesus paid the price for us to have peace amen somebody Jesus paid the price for us to have peace flip over to Luke chapter 4 Luke chapter 4 let's look at verse 18 This is Jesus speaking here. He says, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me because He has anointed me to proclaim good news to the poor, to set the captives free, to proclaim liberty to the captives, to recover sight to the blind, and to set at liberty those who are oppressed, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. Jesus said, This is why I've come. I have been anointed to speak good things to people that are poor, people who are downtrodden, people who have allowed life to dry up their bones, people that have been hurt, people who they're so tunnel vision that it's almost like they're blind because they can't see the truth, but I've come to show them the truth. Those who have been captive by words and actions of other people or maybe even words and actions and lusts of their own flesh. I've come to set them free. Jesus said, the Lord's favor is here, and it's freedom. That's the Lord's favor, is freedom. It's the fact that you now have the opportunity to walk free from this junk that would want to control your life. You just begin to believe what Jesus said and stop believing that lie. Let's flip over to John chapter 14. I love this scripture. John 14 and verse 27 says, peace I leave with you. My peace I give to you. Not the kind of peace the world gives, but I give to you my peace. Don't let your heart be troubled and don't be afraid. It's one of the last things that Jesus said before he ascended into heaven. Because everybody thought, oh man, this has got to be bad news, right? Jesus is leaving and we're left. And Jesus said, no, 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 no. He says, actually better for you that I go away. He said, so that the Holy Spirit can come. And the Holy Spirit can comfort you because the Holy Spirit's the comforter. And he's going to give you power to do stuff and you're going to be able to go out in my name and evangelize the world. He said, but there's going to be people that are against you. He said, and I know I'm not going to be here because they were thinking, what could be better than Jesus being here? I mean, we have fish and bread like for days, you know? Even if we just have a little bit, there's plenty. Jesus is here. People who are sick and stuff are getting healed. It's great. What could be better than that? He said, don't let your hearts be troubled. He said, because I'm leaving you with peace. I'm giving you my peace. Because there's going to be trials. Because there's going to be people come against you. There's going to be people despise you and reject you. But my peace is going to help you to navigate those different challenges. My peace and the security and dependence that you have on me, Jesus was telling them, is going to help you to navigate those trials and those circumstances. Oppression, fear, anxiety, depression, unforgiveness, and all of those things rob us of peace, and they will affect us physically, mentally, and emotionally. But Jesus paid the price for us to walk in peace. Amen? The stripes of Jesus brought healing because of his act on the cross. And we've been talking about that over the past three weeks uh, concerning physical healing. And even Matthew 8 and 17 actually references Isaiah 53 by saying after Jesus physically healed some people, he said this is to fulfill what the prophet Isaiah said where he healed their sickness and their disease and carried their griefs and carried their sorrow. So we know that physical healing is a part of that but also that emotional health is a part of that as well. He wants us to be healed spirit, soul, and body. He wants us to be completely made whole. He wants us to be reconnected to God. He wants us to walk in His joy. He wants us to walk in His peace. And He wants us to walk in His contentment. And I think this is the key of the whole thing. Contentment. Contentment. Godly contentment. is great gain. Contentment in Christ will heal our woundedness. Oh, let me me say that again. I know it's on the screen. I don't care. I'm going to say it again. Contentment in Christ heals our woundedness. In other words, 
Jesus is enough. Oh man, Jesus is enough. Christ is our all in all. Christ is enough for me. That's why we can hear stories, because that's all you and I have experienced up until this point, more than likely, is stories. We hear stories about people in third world countries who meet to discuss scripture and to worship God together in private for fear of their very lives being taken from them because they know if they get found out that they may get thrown in jail, that they may actually get shot, or worse than that, that they may actually take those people's family members and beat them or kill them in front of the others trying to get them to recant trying to get them to say, no, I don't believe. That's happening in our world today. You're sitting in a comfortable chair in an auditorium with air conditioning, hearing the scripture, opening your own personal Bible. We have no idea what some people go through for the cause of Christ. And even if we hear stories, it's still, we don't fully appreciate what they go through and understand. But yet they do it every single day. Why? It's easy for you and I to come to church and to serve Christ. We got no excuse, right? We don't. I mean, we literally, there's no good excuse for us. For them, we would go, I would understand if you missed a Sunday. I would understand if you wanted to stay home that day. It's kind of dangerous. I I would understand if, you know, but yet they still are so faithful and so committed to the cause of Christ that they truly understand what Jesus himself said. Where he said, what can man do to you? Why are you afraid of man? He said, all he can do is kill your body. That's it. But he has no say so over what happens to your soul. He said, why are you living afraid of him? He said, instead, why don't you live in fear of God who can take both soul and body? He said, why instead aren't you trying to please him? Why are you worried about what somebody else thinks about you? He said, why are you worried about that? Why are you living in fear of him? Why are you trying to win brownie points with him? Why, oh, what? Yeah, he can, ta- he can kill you, yeah. That, that hurts some people. If you died, some people would mourn you, they'd grieve you, but you wouldn't be mourning and grieving if you were dead. You'd be like, this is awesome. Oh, I can't believe how amazing being in the presence of God is. That's what you would be saying, because to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord, amen? So what are we afraid of? You see, the reason that those people in those third world countries can do what they do with their lives being wagered daily, every time, even them owning portions of Scripture. I've seen pictures and heard stories of people who only have certain pages of the Bible because they were smuggled into their country. They don't even have the whole thing like you and I have. We'll get our name printed on it. We'll get custom covers. We'll get some with awesome footnotes. They may have just one page that was torn out and smuggled into their country. And, and they, they, they probably treat that as so precious. But them owning that page could cost them their life. Could imprison their body, but could never take away their freedom. Because they have something. They have contentment in Christ. Christ being enough. They don't worry about vacation. They're not worried about buying that new house they got their eye on. They're not worried about and consumed with getting a car better than the neighbor's car because they just got a new car and you've been driving your car for two years and now it's time to upgrade because, oh my goodness, we've got to keep up. Those are the things we get so wrapped up and consumed with and we miss the point. That's where Christ isn't enough for us if we're living that way. But for people who understand the value and truly believe, they go, no, Christ is enough. Everything that you own and everything you hold dear could be taken from you. Is Christ still enough? Is Christ still enough? Because if I'm content in Christ, 
Oh, that's great gain. Because it begins to heal my woundedness. Instead of me worrying about that person getting what they deserve because of what they did to me, instead I say, God, I pray that you bless them. I pray that they see the truth. I pray that they are set free. I pray that they come to repentance. And I pray, Lord, that they see your truth and they grow. I pray that their family is blessed. I pray that they would just see your love and be able to share your love with other people because of what you're going to do in their heart. What if you did that instead of, oh my goodness, let me get, you know they didn't even talk to me today. You know that they didn't even look at me. Oh, I know they didn't look at me because they don't want to feel my wrath because if they get up in my grill, they are going to feel my wrath. Let me find a good emoji for that. There's some flame emojis. Yep, put some fire emojis in here. Yep, let them know they're going to feel my wrath. And then the next person wants to get right back in there and stir all that up. You can do that. You can go on the rest of your life doing that. And you can chain yourself to the junk that Christ has set you free from. It's self-selected slavery. Where you're actually choosing to be a slave because you're empowering what that person did to take control of your life. By rehashing it, by gossiping, by spreading it around, by meditating on it, by marinating on it. You know, I love when I have a really good chicken marinade. That marinade infuses. I know you're getting hungry because it's almost lunchtime. That meat gets infused with that stuff it's surrounded with. You know, the more that you marinate in what somebody did wrong to you, the more it's going to infuse into your life and the more that that junk is going to be harder to tell. Is this really me or is this just something that I've been dealing with? I don't know. I, before, I, I, I was happy before and now I'm miserable. Now I'm getting sick. Now I'm, now, now I'm frustrated. Now I'm short with my kids. I'm short with my wife. Now I treat my friends differently or I isolate myself and I don't even want to have friends because it's burned so bad. That's bondage, Right? Christ has set you free. Matter of fact, he said, why don't you take my yoke instead? If you want to carry around a burden because you're so hard-headed that you just like, you want to carry something around, take this one. He said, because my yoke is easy. My burden's light. Why don't you take this upon you? Because in this world, I, I'm, I'm going to give you peace. He said, this world's going to try to steal from you. This world's going to try to destroy your joy. This the world's going to try to rob from you all of the good things that God wants to put in you. The enemy will try to rob you of this message when you walk out these doors. Maybe even before you walk out these doors, because maybe there's somebody here you're upset with. The enemy wants to just try to steal, rob, instead of us submitting to that truth and that truth setting us free, because he the Son sets free is free indeed. That's how it works. Jesus took this stuff on the cross. Why are we going to let him die in vain? Because instead we want to hold on to the things that he bought and paid so we don't have to be chained and enslaved to. Amen? This is a freeing message that should cause us to exhale and go, Jesus is enough. He's enough. I don't have to have vengeance on that person. I don't have to wish them failure. Instead, I can pray blessing upon them and go countercultural. So then all of a sudden the world starts to go, what? You mean you don't want to get in a big gossip session about so-and-so? No, I don't play that game. I don't roll that way. Because this is how Christ has changed my life. Have you given that stress to Jesus? Have you given it to Him? Have you let Him work forgiveness in your heart towards others that have wounded you? Or are you still holding on to it? How long are you going to hold on to that? Is that helping or is that hurting? Is it sucking the life out of you? Making you a happier person, more content, more at peace? Or is it keeping you up at night? Is it making you do things that are dumb because you're making dumb decisions because your brain and your heart are clouded? You need peace. Guess what? I know the one who gives peace. I know the source of peace. His name is Jesus. He said, my peace I give to you. Fear is not who you are. Hello, somebody. Stop identifying with your chains. Stop wearing the name tag. It's not a tattoo on your life that can't be removed. It's just a name tag that you need to rip off because it's not really who you are. It's something that somebody told you you are. What that ninth grade teacher told you that you've been believing that lie 
because he told you you could, you could never do this kind of work, or you'd always be this type of person, or you'd never succeed. That lie you've been believing and reciting over and over and over and over and over and over in your head all over again, you believe it. It's time for you to start believing something else, amen? Because that's not true. You need to believe the truth. It's the truth that sets you free. The truth says you're a new creation in Christ Jesus. Old things are passed away. All things have become new. The truth is, is you, you don't have to be a slave to what that spouse did to you. You don't have to be a slave to what your parents did to you. You don't have to be a slave to what was allowed in your home. You don't have to be a slave to what your boss did. You don't have to be a slave to what that so-called best friend did or said. Don't choose to be a slave of that. Instead, say, Jesus, I need you to take this and help me to walk in forgiveness because I'm struggling right now. Help me to walk in love and help me to walk in your peace. I need to depend on you and just say, Jesus, you are enough. If everybody rejects me, if everybody despises me, if I still have faith in Christ, I have enough and I can be a person of peace in the middle of a storm. Not because of anything you possess, but because you know who you are and whose you are. Because you're a child of the king. Because he thought you so valuable that he sent his son to die for you so you could be reconnected to him. So he could take your grief and your sorrow upon himself so you could know peace. Because he knew in this world you were going to have trouble. He said, in this world you're going to have trouble. He said, but don't be afraid. I give you peace. Don't be afraid. Stuff's going to come to try to make you very afraid. Have you told him you need him? Have you asked him to show you what you need to do to walk in that freedom? Have you said, I don't, need, I don't know what to do. I don't know what to do, God. Show me what I need to do to walk in this peace and this freedom because I don't want to allow this situation to dictate my joy and to suck the life out of me to suck the very life out of my bones to where they're dry and brittle and I'm weak. I want to be strong. I want to be full of joy. The joy of the Lord is our strength. Is all this making sense to you today? It's real. This is real. This is not some fairy tale. This is not some idea Pastor Derek came up with. This is real. This is legit stuff. God wants you and me to walk in freedom. And man, there's so many times where I don't trust Him just like you. Where I try to look into my own self to try to find the answer, to try to figure the situation out, try to manipulate it to work in my favor. That's wrong. We need to stop doing that. And we need to say, God, you show me what to do. If it's forgive that person, then you need to make that phone call or set up that meeting or write that letter or whatever you need to do. If it's to allow yourself to receive forgiveness for what you've done, then you need to understand that there's no transgression that you could commit that he can't forgive because he was wounded for your transgression. Amen? And you need to say, I, I receive your forgiveness, Jesus. If it's that you don't feel worthy of his love, it's because you're not. But he chose to give it to you anyways. And stop trying to earn his love because you don't have to. It's a gift. It's something he chose to do. He chose you before you ever chose him. He said, I'm going to choose to love them before they even ever know who I am. Because God so loved the world. Amen? That he gave his only son for you, for me. Whoever believes wouldn't perish, have life everlasting. Pray this message has challenged you, has encouraged you. Why don't we go to the Lord in prayer before we go this morning? Thank you for listening. For more information, please visit wogcc.com.